Hello everybody and welcome to another top 10 edition of Magic Mike's, proudly sponsored by our Patreon supporters and CoolStuffInc.com where you can find cool stuff in stock every day and our co-sponsor CardHoarder.com offering the best inventory prices and delivery of cards for Magic Online. I am Terrible Idea Factory Evan Irwin and we get started each week by saying hello to my two co-hosts Aaron Campbell. Hi. Ruben Bressler. Terrible idea factory. It's just, it's a good epithet. It, it gets, it gets through the mouth. It gets through the That's thing. Right. It's the talk. Helps yeah. do it. It's good to remind everybody of, uh, uh, you know, y- y- you could have some bad ideas, but at least you're not a terrible idea. Well, I, bl- I believe they call that reclaiming. You know, you're <clears throat> taking something that was supposed to be an insult and you're making it fun. There you go. <laughs> we also begin with our choice of the top comment from last week in a segment we call honorable mention, where Ruben will tell us who was the most elegant or eloquent. Well, I heard that one also. Are we are we elegant or are we eloquent? I like eloquent. I like real eloquent. 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 <laughs> and letting us know. We, right. Who uh, what card we did not choose is one of our top 10 pip cards, Ruben. This is the best comment of the week, but it also might be the best comment of all time uh in honorable mention. Uh the most elephant comment this week goes to Amber Anarchy. Yes. <clears throat> who writes Amber. Evan You really messed up this time. How could you forget the card that put you on the map? Hashtag three pips seriously. That's a nice comment. Didn't even need to reference the card name, Spectral Procession. Uh, just a just a perfect perfect co- amalgamation of of uh, content and creativity. We yeah. had some very passionate fans this week. A lot of Grizzlebrand fans yep. in the chat in the comments. Mm. Um, Amber has been a a passionate fan of Magic Mike's for a while. Uh, she's in England. Um, mm. She will watch me stream sometimes, even though it's four or five in the morning in the UK. She will come by and watch me stream. She's been on our Discord forever, keeping the conversation going. Um, and I can't think of anybody who deserves this more. So thank you, Amber. And she's Trans Mafia. So. So right. Right. And, nice. and a big, big, big fan of uh, Broken Pact as mm-hmm. well. Constantly Very in our supportive. Chat. Yeah, congratulations, Amber. Thanks so much for reminding me that Spectral Possession is absolutely a pip, pip, pip card. It is uh, three white or uh, it is it is hybrid. It is dual hybrid. It's colorless hybrid. So you can pay two generic mana or white. So you can pay six generic mana or three white for the spell. But Spectral Possession did come from Shadow Moors and Uncommon. It was a sorcery that puts three 1-1 one, one white creature spirit tokens on with flying onto the battlefield. And I, of course, uh, famously at the time, uh, made a complete ass of myself and decided <laughs> to say... This was three dudes seriously, and I can't believe this is what mm-hmm. we got out of the cycle because there was a cycle of this. No one remembers yeah. it because they only remember this one. But I was going to say, can you name any of the other ones, Evan? I didn't uh, know it was a cycle. I just learned that today. I, yeah, I remember Beseech the Queen. Yeah, um, that's the black one. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and I don't remember so the rest. So Flame Javelin is the other easy one. Flame Javelin's dope, yep. Ta- uh, I think it's like Tower Above. I think that sounds about right. Yes, yes. And something with the Fey on the blue one, right? Yes. I think it's like Dreams of the Fey or Secrets of the Fey or something weird like huh. that. Something like that. Yeah. But, but I don't know. because, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. And so who knew that three mana for three white creatures is actually an amazing rate, which it totally was. And uh, uh, advice from the Fey. That's advice. The there you go. Okay. Uh, I, I do appreciate at the time uh, Patrick Chapin kind of slew in the, DM, slid in the DMs and was like, uh, Evan, yeah. um, uh, spectral Obsession seems to be like really, really good. Yeah. And I was like, well, show's already made. Sorry. <laughs> I've already, I've already thrown down one. Look, sometimes you have to lay the cornerstone when you're building a factory of terrible ideas. That's true. And you also have to give, I mean, part of being a celebrity is, and you, especially if you're working with other people is you have to give your peers a time to shine. And so I like to think of it as if we miss something, we're giving YouTube, we're giving the fans right. a chance to chime in exactly. and really slay us with those comments and those honorable <clears throat> mentions. Very nice well thanks again amber for that and you, you you get a 50 dollars coolstuffinc.com gift certificate i'm sure you know where to find aaron so we can get you that code asap and of course for those listening you can get your chance by interacting with us on this show what i what we did not choose is one of our top 10 2019 cards uh which means i get to segment you know segue into the top 10 2019 cards because they're Perfect. sweet uh but in a weird twist of fate aaron it's hosed on the sames and hires this week. Yeah, I have uh, three hires and two sames. My number 10 is my first hire. So I just made sure to wear a tank top tonight. So I'm, mm. I'm, I'm just going to do my thing. So just... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not too far behind. <clears throat> I have two hires and two sames. Okay. One hire. Are you going to wear a tank top too, Ruben? I could. I can roll up the sleeves if you want to see the wrestlers. <laughs> oh my yes. God. Perfect wrestlers. This is Mox and this is Ruby. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, this is Mox, and this is... Never mind. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. So let's get the show on the road here with our number 10. Aaron, you said you didn't have one. But Ruben, do you have a number 10? I do. And uh, my number 10, I tried finding in Scryfall, and somehow they didn't put it in there. Um, which is kind of hilarious to me. It's technically not a Magic the Gathering card. It's a mm. Ponies the Galloping card. Okay. So okay. I guess that's why it's not in Scryfall, but it still feels to me like it should be in there. Earlier this year, Wizards of the Coast was raising funds for Extra Life, which is uh, Seattle Children's Hospital. They do this every year with, with uh, Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, among the things that they helped do with uh, Extra Life, which helped raise over $50,000 just for this Ponies the Galloping um, thing, I believe, nice. uh, was uh, Ponies the Galloping, which came out with a few silver-bordered magic cards, that are one of which was double-sided, and a couple of playmats. Um, and the one that I decided to highlight here is Princess Twilight Sparkle. Mm. Princess Twilight Sparkle, for those of you playing along at home, is a legendary creature, all alicorn. For a colorless and a blue, you get a 2-2 with flying. Other alicorns, horses, pegasi, ponies, and unicorns you control get plus one, plus one. And white, blue, black, red, green, or Wooburg mana. If you control Applejack, Fluttershy, Pinkie Pie, Rainbow Dash, <laughs> and Rarity, every Ooh. pony wins the game. With the flavor text, friendship isn't always easy, but there's no doubt it's worth fighting for. Aww. Goodness gracious. So this came in a box with Tw Princess Twilight Sparkle, Rarity, and Nightmare Moon, which flips into Princess Luna. Um, and uh, there were there were three playmats as well that went along with this. And they mm. were uh, they sold out like gangbusters, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. Uh, sleeves mm. that were associated with this as well. It was a really good promotion. Yeah, there was, a, there was a very small window of time in which you could buy it. And it was like $20 for the set and $30 went to charity. Um, and they sold up as much as they could. And Ultra Pro did a bunch of the playmats. You could buy a whole set of the playmats and whatnot um and this is also wizards just branching out into their own to the properties that they can <clears throat> they are a subsidiary of hasbro so everything hasbro owns they can go and take and work with so they're working with transformers they're now working with my little pony i think this is great i think there's going to be a monopoly man magic card but probably before the next five years is over um and I i'm here for it i'm okay yeah. go nuts like yeah great. I, I do i do think and I still am waiting for Wizards to realize that they have the greatest, not just the greatest game, they have the greatest game system. Mm. And so if you go look at Star Wars The Gathering that people have made as a fan set, when yep. you turn those, just using the mana symbol and the, the the color philosophies as ways to use other properties in games, like, it's right there. It's right, mm -hmm. I don't understand why they don't do it. Anyway, that card is dope. Uh, for my number 10, I have what I could pretty clearly uh say here let's see this was the make sure i get the right the right one here okay here we go um <clears throat> this is the number one edh card to come out this year and i mean it's not close like it is not even remotely close okay maybe it's a little close but it's pretty not close for for a reason um and that reason is there's certain colors, you know, that do certain things. And in Commander, it's really tough sometimes to get things to work in different colors or whatever. So when Wizards made Ravnica Allegiance, they made a very specific card that did something really interesting and weird and really awesome in multiplayer and really cool for white because no one had ever seen anything like Smothering Tithe. Mm -hmm. Smothering Tithe is currently $8. It's just a rare yeah. from Ravnica Allegiance. It is a white and three generic mana for a rare enchantment that says whenever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two generic mana. If they don't, you create a treasure artifact token with tap sacrifice this artifact uh, to add one mana of any color. So now white essentially has ramp, as it were. It's sort of taxing its opponents, which is the thing that it does. Uh, and as far as I can tell, casual players just went absolutely hog wild for this card. Yeah, mm. I have this. I, I I can honestly say any white deck, any commander deck I have with white in it has this. Queen Marchesa has this. Oketra's Bouncy Castle has this. There's been a lot of talk lately about how underpowered white is, just in general. Mm. Um, and I remember when I decided to build my Oketra deck, that was something that people had kind of warned me about. They were like, hey, 
it's it's kind of rough out there. And I actually kind of enjoyed being able to play in sort of a very limited sandbox. And I actually thought it made deck building easier. But, um, you know, it's one of the few overpowered cards in white that we've gotten recently. Um, you know, it helps you ramp into multiple colors, whereas normally normally the ramp that white gives you is just raw lands, and usually it's planes. Um, so you're right, it hits on the taxing part, it ramps you into different colors. Um, most people don't pay it. It's also artifacts, so if you happen to be playing Revel and Riches too, mm-hmm. you can win the game. Or if you're doing anything with invoking artifacts if you're playing Sharoom, um you know that type matters in terms of it being an artifact and um it's just a great card and and if you're definitely playing white and commander pick yourself up a copy yeah you should probably get them sooner than later this is the type of card that turns into 20 25 30 dollars i got mine from prize tickets like i was at a gp and i didn't quite have enough for anything good so i was like let's get some singles and i was like oh a smothery type for four tickets sure yeah. you know <laughs> easy done all right that's awesome i'm having a excuse me i'm having a good time with smothering tithe uh in brawl uh Mm. because a lot of people use nickel bolas dragon god uh and turns out you just sacrifice the coin you make when they try to plus up Mm -hmm. nickel bolas thanks pretty great appreciate that yeah it is certainly one of the best uh commander cards that have ever been made for white and specifically Mm -hmm. and i was like it's it's the number one commander because if we get here to number nine we get to the actual best commander card of the year. Uh, it, it, would you call it cheating? I don't know if you call it cheating. If you're going to make a new product that's in a very commander s type format, but yet you yeah. want to make something that is so ubiquitous, it was going to want to fit into every single commander deck forever. Right. The number one commander deck and my number nine or uh, card for this year is uh, Arcane Signet. Arcane Signet. Nice. Arcane Signet. I Signet. was very close to putting this one on my list too, but... Yeah. It's just so impactful. Arcane Signet is two generic mana for a common artifact, quote unquote, common artifact that you can only get out of the Brawl decks yeah. as of right now. Uh, and it has tap, add one mana of any color and your commander's color identity. So this is the ultimate mana rock for commander. Yeah. It goes in everything. So actually, no, it doesn't. And that's Mm -hmm. actually something to touch on. So I had the pleasure of being at Commander Fest DC this past weekend. And if you were there, thank you for, you know, asking me to sign things and and play games with me. I had a really good time. But uh, I also got to participate in a roundtable while while I was at Commander DC with Sheldon Mennery and Olivia Gilbert Hicks and Adam Sikorsky and several Commander players. And um, this card has inspired a lot of discussion in terms of Mana Rocks and their place in Commander and whether or not they're as essential as people think they are. Um, A lot of people think they need the soul rings the arcane signets in your mono black deck and so um there's a lot of conversation about you know do you really need this card you know what decks want this card do you need this card does playing this card and a lot of mana rocks change you from being casual to competitive um i got to hear a lot of discussions about where people think commander is going right now and this card certainly played into those discussions of you know does everybody really need this card we're not so sure Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I was playing Brawl earlier, <clears throat> and uh, my opponent was playing Ayara and played a turn to Arcane Signet, and that did feel a little strange. Yeah, um, I could see if you were doing, like, three or more colors, but if you're playing yeah. one or two, I don't think you need <clears throat> those. Right, like, if you're trying to trigger Golos, then mm-hmm. sure, have your Arcane Signets, but yeah. Right. And I trust that you were using ArenaBrawl.net instead of paying Wizards $12 oh, good, for... Oh, good heavens, I don't have... <laughs> I was playing Brawl days. Of course I was. Uh, I don't have the patience to try to finagle. They got me for my, you know, gold that I make. I, I play three games a morning and complete my quests. It's not actually $12 for me. You're, you're encouraging them. I know. I'm the worst. God. All right. I'll be like, oh, these are so bad for me as I still eat my French fries. If is basically what I'm doing. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I haven't. And I, 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 I feel the pull. I feel the pull. We know, oh, Evan. Friend. We know. Wow. <laughs> and the tug, as it turns out. Um, Ruben, what is your number nine? Can't take you anywhere. My number nine <clears throat> is my favorite of this grouping of cards. Somehow this is the one that's on Scryfall, whereas Princess uh, Ponies the Gathering wasn't. This isn't even a real card. This is a uh, mystery booster playtest card and mm. why I chose it. Uh, my number nine is Problematic Volcano. Oh, jeez. Uh, Problematic Volcano is a colorless and two red mana. It's a world enchantment. Uh, illustrated by Gavin Verhey, and I'll explain why once we uh, get through the text, I guess. When Problematic Volcano enters the battlefield, it deals four damage to any target. 
Then, starting with you, each player assigns their creatures to the left or right of the volcano. Creatures enter the battlefield on the left or right of the volcano. Creatures can't block creatures on the other side of the volcano. Oh, God. Um, yeah, so this harkens back to the card Raging River, I think was what it was called, which was an old world enchantment that uh, you had was basically the same thing. They started on one side of the river or the other. <clears throat> um, separating them into two separate groups. Uh, and of course, Gavin illustrated this because he had an infamous a infamous uh, circumstance in which he yeah. fell down a volcano. Um, like you do. It's true. Like you do. Uh, this was in, oh, I'm going to say 2014, Something 2015. Like he was on the Magic Cruise, I think. Or no, he was on the Joko Cruise. Mm-hmm. And they were hiking in an island somewhere and the uh the path collapsed beneath his feet and he fell down a ravine into a dormant volcano was left behind by his crews and what ensued was a uh a, a Jonathan Swift style adventure nothing short of Gulliver's travels in which uh Gavin became a legend of uh of epic proportions and this was a a, an excellent way to pay homage to that story and part of these hilarious mystery uh booster playtest cards cards like 33 dollars are you kidding me they all are they're all a million dollars aren't they i guess someone's listed one here for for 20 um which is in itself kind of amazing. Um, and and are they I, all a zillion? Aren't, is it like every single one of them at least ten dollars? Uh, I don't know, but I think they're all going to trend downward very, very quickly, and then they're going to stay there forever. Yeah. Um, but as of right now, they are definitely collectible and hard to find. Um, and the mystery boosters keep selling out at Grand Prix, even at Oklahoma City, when there was less than three fifty in the main event the mystery boosters were gone. So, and that also includes people who would join events just to drop and take the boosters and put them on well, eBay yeah. or whatever. Um, but either way, problematic volcano is sweet. Search up Gavin Verhey volcano. You'll find it. Uh, very oh, yeah. famous. When you type in Gavin Verhey, I think volcano auto completes. Nice. Nice. All right. Aaron, do you have a number nine? I do. So my number nine is a card that changed the game in Vintage. So prior to this card coming out, Mishra's Workshop had been uh, in people's crosshairs for a while. Everybody hates shops. No one wants to face shops. Everyone thinks shops should be restricted. And I happen to be one of the people that like, few people that like shops. I think Workshops belongs in the format. I think it's a pillar of Vintage. Um, But people have always had a hard time with these sort of artifact decks. And then this card came along and you don't hear people complaining about shops anymore because because Dredge is playing this card, uh, the bug decks are playing this card, um, and a lot of other strategies have gone down a bit in terms of stacks to card Monty, um, and Shops isn't nearly the boogeyman that it used to be because of this card, my number nine, which is Force of Vigor. Um, so Force of Vigor is two colorless and two green. It's an instant. If it's not your turn, you may exile a green card from your hand. Rather than pay the spell's mana cost, destroy up to two target artifacts and or enchantments. So um, this, I, I truly believe that this card is the reason why Grave Troll got restricted. Because if you give Dredge all these green cards and mm-hmm. Force of Vigor, artifact hate and enchantment hate doesn't matter anymore. Um, you started seeing people running Ravenous Traps in response to this and Containment Priests in response to this because you couldn't deal with it this way. But, you know, gone are the days of folding to a Graph Digger's Cage or even a Ley Line anymore when you have something like this. Um, or if you're just trying to play a fair game, destroying Moxon. If you're playing against a paradoxical outcome deck and they target a bunch of moxen you can target two of the moxen and then they don't get as many cards and so um this card just changed the game um it sees a little bit of play in the other formats like legacy and modern but vintage is really where this card found a home and the things you can do with it are just uh hilarious there's a lot of artifacts and enchantments in that mm-hmm, old yeah. format as it turns out all of the forces were really interesting from modern horizons force of rage was terrible Force of Despair was okay. <laughs> that destroyed all creatures that entered the battlefield. That was the black one. Uh, the white one was Glorious Anthem. So not good enough, honestly, for any conversations, which was I, kind of I weird. I sworn I saw a deck playing it maybe in Legacy, I think. Legacy yeah. or Modern. I think they were like a white knight deck was playing right. it or something. It was, I mean, it was only happening for like a week. But. Right. I remember for like, you know, two seconds, like, oh, Force of Virtue, and it's gone. No one ever talks about it ever again. Yeah. Versus Force of Vigor and Force of Negation that has stuck around for so long. The oh, really yeah. interesting thing about uh, Force of Vigor for me is that the argument against Force of Will and Force of Negation are that they two-for-one yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, Force of Vigor is parody. You're two-for-twoing mm-hmm. yourself. You're trading on mm-hmm. level, and so it's 
for my money, better the newer in the newer formats as well, not just vintage. Mm-hmm. It's also good in modern if the format shifts in, in such a way as that it becomes good. It's good in legacy if the format shifts. But obviously, because there's so many more artifacts in vintage, it's insanely good there. Yeah, I feel like, again, Force of Rage is like, really? Two, three, one, haste, guys? Okay, whatever. <laughs> um, that's that's weird. But I think right. all of the other ones were really trying to, you know, sort of carve out a very specific niche of, okay, you're black, you need to deal with some creatures, this is how you can do it without using any mana. You're white, you want to pump your creatures, this is how you can do it without any mana. And yeah. for green, you want to answer things. For blue, you want to answer things. And red, you just want to poop the bed. Because um, it's bed pooping. Somebody needs to do it. Wow. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, Ruben, what's your number eight? My number eight is a card that, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. My number eight's actually higher. I Ooh. almost started talking about it. But oh my, my number goodness. eight is higher on someone else's list. Oh, no. Aaron, do you have a number eight? My eight's higher, too. <clears throat> See you at number seven. Well, I got a number eight. And this there card, <laughs> okay, look, look. As time has gone on, it starts to look more and more like food Christmas? is a mistake food is used very similar to energy and not like treasure tokens and not like um and not like clues because it can be yeah because it can be paid for you can pay for different abilities with food the Mm -hmm. food that comes out of different things and cards and creatures it can be you know this is where the food can be one man of any color this mm. food could be one of your permanents on the top two cards of your library. Yeah. This this food could be a plus one plus one counter on wolf and makes it indestructible. You know, this food could be stacked with two others to get back the feasting troll king. Like there's a bunch of ways that the food sort of turns it. And then on top of all of that, it's an artifact and it gains you three life. So it keeps the gain lasting longer and it hurts aggro in and of itself in, in terms of what it does. So when they have my number eight, which is Gilded Goose. Gilded Goose is a just it's a phenomenal magic card in terms of like what it does at the rate that it does and how it makes it the fact that like when I read it and I was like okay green O2 flying okay cool uh you sacrifice the toe sacrifice the food to add mana okay cool great I, I was 100% not expecting the ability for the goose itself to make food that is where I feel, more eggs yeah that's where I feel they push this card you know like I, I can totally see this card without that middle ability Anyway, Gilded Goose, for those who don't know, is a green O2. It's a rare bird from Throne of Eldraine. Uh, it has flying, and uh, and whenever Gilded Gild Goose enters the battlefield, to create a food token was an artifact with two generic mana taps, sacrifice it to gain three life. You can pay a green a generic mana tap colon to create a food token, or tap, sacrifice a food, add one mana of any color. So it is an engine unto itself. It's a life gain engine to itself. It is a permanent creator. It is a permanent that can be used in like four different ways that are all very powerful and impactful. Whether they're drawing your cards, gaining your life, killing stuff, keeping things from dying. It's ridiculous. And as I keep looking more and more as food, like energy, it starts to, you start to look like the same picture essentially, which is both of these things create resources that turn into a whole variety of things. Clues did not morph themselves into weird abilities. There's like one card you can sacrifice clues to and it was unplayable. So no one cared. And treasure tokens, there was stuff that you could sacrifice treasure tokens for, but that's just called your spells. You're just playing magic at that point. But now this resource that not only gains you life, makes things that, that impact things and makes the game last longer. It's a whole host of things of like, wow, I don't think food is going to be looked upon as a good positive mechanic in the future. So this card is currently seeing play in Modern. Um, this has been a huge part in the Urza decks. Yeah. Um, it's a Sultai Urza deck. It's one of the top three decks in Modern right now. Um, you run Gilded Goose, Emery, Spellqueller, Urza, Oko, and you have yourself a good time there. Yeah. Um, it used to run Paradoxical Outcome. I don't think it does anymore, but um, you know, you're know, you just playing a sort of fair game. The fact that food is an artifact certainly matters when you're playing a card like Urza, mm-hmm. um, because that food token can now be tapped for mana. That food token can be used to make that construct bigger like that that type the type that it is matters and on top of that it fixes your mana too um i mean it, if it's good enough to see modern i mean people don't think of modern as being too big of a gulf away from standard but it really is and the fact that a mana dork they ain't playing sylvan Curiated in modern right. they're not playing lanawar elves in modern they're playing gilded goose and right. and it's in a tier one deck that's mildly terrifying yeah. My yeah. my first game with Throne of Eldraine cards during the Early Access Streamer event, I went turn one Gilded Goose, turn two Oko. And I don't think it's ever gotten better than that. I think that that was where I, I peaked. 
in terms of my magic playing potential. Uh, Gilded Goose, of course, is ridiculous. Um, it is two permanents on a one mana card, uh, Thraven Instigator style. <clears throat> um, but it also is able to ramp you. It is able to uh, grow the number. Uh, it's a flyer, so it can stand in front of, you know, it's, it does everything a Bird of Paradise wants to do, but also everything a Thraven Instigator wants to do. It's an absurdly powerful card. And also with two toughness instead of one toughness, like mm -hmm. there's so many numbers and so many abilities in this card that were honestly unnecessary from making it a chase rare. I just, I don't feel like it needed to make food in order for us to continue to talk about how powerful and good that card was if you had to kind of reach and work a little bit to make food in different ways. And also, lest we forget, Honk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the timing of this card coming out with, you know, the goose game is yeah. just uncanny. It's pretty good. We went here to number seven. Ruben, do you have a number seven? I do. I do have a number seven. And it's a card that captured the hearts and minds uh, of everyone earlier this year when Autumn Burchett was the winner of the first <laughs> Mythic Championship. Um, there are a number of cards that uh, uh, were very good in the mono blue aggro deck for them, but amongst the leaders in the clubhouse, I think, is Terramander. Uh, Terramander is a 1-1 one -one for a blue mana. It's a Salamander Drake with flying that has the ability seven colorless and a blue adapt four. This ability costs one less to activate for each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard. Um, very often this would only cost one or two mana in order to adapt and turn it into a five, five effectively making it a late game dragon um, because you had so many opts and dive downs and spell pierces and whatnot. Uh, and uh, it, it was, it was a key piece of that mono blue aggro deck uh, in Autumn's uh, uh, deck, and later on took on a life of its own as part of a meme um, with Terramander says trans rights, um, <laughs> and uh, which to this day exists as a as a meme, um, and and uh, it's it's been iconic in that fashion. Even saw a little bit of play in Modern for a time, you know, when the Is It Phoenix deck was number one. That deck died when Faithless Looting got banned. Can we yeah. talk about that? How that deck right. is not on the radar at all anymore. But yeah, that was another thing you could do if you're playing a lot of instant spells and somebody deals with your thing in the ice or, you know, you, you aren't able to get the Phoenix plan off the ground, no pun intended. You can just make a, a, a Terramander and then make it really big and get in there with that. And I remember having to, you know, have those, those discussions myself of is this something i need to kill is this a priority <laughs> the the beauty of of terramander is like well and the beauty of memes really uh is that that meme can live forever Me memes mm -hmm. never go away you can always go back and reference them and yep. at that point they become classic memes and you're like and and the artist even got on board at one point and started selling prints and mm -hmm. all the money went to mermaids which was a uk organization for trans kids and so it was just the perfect confluence of of things very dope aaron what's number seven my number seven is another card that didn't last long in Vintage because it was too damn good. I, I have never really had the desire to play an artifact-based strategy or a shops-based strategy. But when this card came out, I knew I had to give it a try. And it felt as amazing as I thought it would. It didn't even make it six months before it was restricted. Um, and for good reason, the card is hilariously broken. My number seven is Mystic Forge. <laughs> um, so Mystic Forge is four colorless. It's an artifact from M20. It says you may look at the top card of your library anytime. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, you may cast the top card of your library if it's an artifact card or a colorless non-land card. That's not so bad. You're going you're gonna to brick. Something's going to happen. Or you can tap it and pay one life to exile the top card of your library. <laughs> That's kind of dumb. So you put this in a format with Moxon. Yeah. <laughs> you put this in a format with Mishra's Workshop where your land taps for three colorless. You're probably playing Foundry Inspector to where your artifacts now cost one less. Um, some people were running this with Helm of Awakening, which only adds to the discount. Yeah. You can play this with Telerian Academy, which also gives you a huge boost of mana. Um, you're also in a format with Sensei's Divining Top. So if you happen to exit out of the top card and you don't like it um, you also can just play like a manifold key and untap it and do it all over again um, this card was hilarious um, and so if you're doing anything artifact related um, it's currently seen play in legacy right now in the postish decks mm -hmm. the prison decks they really like this card um, in commander if you're doing anything artifact related like shroom put yeah. this in there I promise you will love it um, and just one of the few times that I got to feel something when playing an artifact deck and was restricted in very very short order <laughs> this one's so so obvious like 
I feel like we were talking during the M20 release season and reading the cards and being like, oh, this could be powerful. This could be powerful. And we saw Mystic Forge and it was like, this is so obvious that this is going to get banned. Well, they even gave it to so many insane plays. So they gave yeah. it to a vintage podcast to preview. And I think Nat Mose was somehow involved. Sure. This is one of those. I mean, this is one like, come on. This card is not reasonable. <laughs> yeah. This card does everything. Like it's so good. It's so it's like, why the hell does it have that last ability? <laughs> what is that right. doing on there? What what think it's of the just, children. Yeah. Think of the children. What is happening in your life? You could Absolutely. have the first and second ability, and that stupid thing will be ridiculous. You could have the first ability and the second ability and not say colorless non-land card, and it would still be ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yep. And yet, Wizards yep. is like, no, no, no. <laughs> Allow <laughs> me. Allow me to give you the enable to get that crap off the top of your Do you library. Know how good it feels to get this out on turn one? Just be like, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> it feels so good. <laughs> That's that's filthy. That's disgusting. Oh my god! And wizards, feels great. like seriously, just look how this stupid card just like re- just layers it on. Oh, like it's crazy. it's crazy what you're getting out of the magic cards these days. And yeah, <laughs> instantly freaking restricted. Oh my gosh! All right, I don't well, even think it made it three. I mean, it was fast. It like, was this quick. card got no chance. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. Look, uh, so for my number seven, this is a card that will live in infamy. This is a card that will be probably expensive forever. Uh, This is going to be a card that's going to see play in potentially every commander deck that you ever play. It's going to see play in standard decks from the time it was printed to the time it goes away in a couple years. There is no doubt that they have tried and gotten closer and closer to a Evolving Wilds type card. Mm-hmm. They like Evolving Wilds, and they said, you know what? We can make a lot of money if we made a rare one that was unbelievably awesome, and that's Fabled Passage. Fabled Passage is a rare land from Throne of Eldraine. Tap, sacrifice it, search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield, tap, and then shuffle your library. And then if you control four or more lands, untap that land. So it's just the best basic fetch ever once you have three other lands on the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Oh my god. Not hard to get going. Um, I remember when we did the early access event, um, I got my first taste of this card, and I didn't know how it was going to go, and I was really worried about that. I was like, oh man, is, is this going to be really awkward? Am I going to have to really try to make this thing happen? And nope, you don't really have to try. You can just sort of play magic. And so, um, you know, great for your fixing. Uh, it's a great way to thin your deck. Um, another one of those lands, like, get them now, because they're about $20, $30, you said. And so, yeah, right. very, very good card. Yeah, right. As as we record this, uh, it's about $16 or or so for a copy get them and maybe I would say you can probably wait till they're like 12 ish and then pick up <laughs> as many as you can and shove them in your closet and they'll they'll double in in less than five years right so in a couple years you know do like a, a remind <clears throat> me for set for two yeah. years from now come back and listen to this podcast as we tell you that the pick foil up, right when when throne of eldraine is about to cycle out of standard pick right that up. summer right before it, it does that fall being on that summer because the foil as of right now of fable passage is 21 dollars 48 cents on the market yeah. price so good there's luck no way there's no way it's going to be less than that ever after it rotates exactly let's move on here to number six Ruben what's your number six my number six is the last hire on somebody else's list okay then Aaron what's your number six my number six actually plays very well with my number seven, and they were often used in conjunction with each other. So uh, over the last year or so, we've seen Wizards release these sort of asymmetrical cards that are meant to kind of punish certain play styles. Uh, Lavinia was one of them, where, uh, you know, your opponent couldn't play anything with a zero mana cost if they didn't pay mana to, to do something. You know, cards got countered, and this was a really big hoser. And we weren't done. There were other cards that were released along the same vein. Um, another one of those cards that didn't last very long in Vintage, which is a format that was dominated by artifacts and has also revolutionized, re- revolutionized, revolution, why am I having a hard time with it? Revolutionized. <laughs> revolutionized uh, other formats as well. Um, my number six is Karn the Great Creator. Mm-hmm. Um, so Karn the Great Creator is four colorless, legendary planeswalker Karn from War of the Spark, starting off with five loyalty, has a static ability on it, means that it's always on, you don't need to do anything. Activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control cannot be activated. 
<laughs> so that's Moxon. It's like a null rod on a stick, and it's just your opponent. You are fine. Um, this caused micros- Microsynth Lattice to become a thing, where you could go look for Lattice, and then if everything becomes an artifact, your opponents cannot play the game anymore. Their lands are artifacts. They just There's just nothing you could do at this point. So um, you can plus one Karn until your next turn, up to one target non-creature artifact, becomes an artifact creature with power and toughness each equal to its converted mana cost. So your, you know, your, your ensnaring bridge can become a creature. Your null rod can become a creature. Your trinosphere can become a creature. Um, you can also minus two, and you may choose an artifact card you own from outside the game or in exile. Reveal that card and put it into your hand. It's like a burning wish for artifacts that you can do over and over again. So Eldrazi Tron is now the number one deck in modern right now, largely because of this card. Um, Tron itself now changes the way that it plays because of this Karn. It used to want to just get to eight and do other Karn things. Oh no, this is the hotness now. Um, the legacy decks that tend to play prison style strategies really love this card. Um, Vintage, of course, loved this card and it was terrible in a, in the best way in Vintage and was restricted pretty promptly. Um, but again, just through these asymmetrical punishing effects that don't hinder you and that also give you a powerful ability to turn your artifact deck into a toolbox deck, essentially, is terrifying. Well, the, yeah, between your artifact deck and your Eldrazi deck that you're able to do what you want. Oh my god, this is... What is War of the Spark at this point? War of the Spark was... Yeah. When the when you gave the eight year old kid the actual keys to the candy store and said, you know what, you go in there and you eat every piece of chocolate, you go every you know sweet thing you can put in your face, you just go. Once and we got thirty six freaking planeswalkers was the result. Once they started putting static abilities on planeswalkers, and every planeswalker sort of been sort of became a prison piece. It was over at that point. Planeswalkers became the only thing that you should be doing. Um, and it was, uh, it, and Karn is a great poster child for that. And they're like, you know, and because Planeswalkers are exciting, they're sort of inherently, you know, they're, they're big, powerful, swingy cards. And now there has to be uncommon ones, there has to be rare ones, and there has to be mythic ones, and they all have to somehow differentiate themselves. And so now they become like super enchantments that have their own life total, essentially. And so now these super enchantments are doing stupidly powerful things, yeah. and it's fun to you know to be jacked up on all that sugar and then the sugar high goes away and you go oh my god what did we do to our formats what happened between karn and i'm sure we'll talk about others as well Mm -hmm. from this year but man this is this is just sort of getting us started on the road of 2019 and planeswalkers and we're gonna have to have a conversation about all that Mm -hmm. oh boy all right so my number six is something that we had mentioned earlier and uh, it's it's a hell of a magic card. Um, it's actually went down quite a bit, uh, as it turns out, from its original, like, oh my god, this is easily a $50 bill and it'll always be a $50 bill. But I definitely know that there is still a, a sex factor attached to a card that is as powerful and cool and interesting as Force of Negation. Mm-hmm. Force of Negation is... The force of will we didn't know that we needed, but we needed, and it fixed right. itself in a very unique way. Let's check it out. Two blue, one generic mana for a rare instant from Modern Horizons. If it's not your turn, those are the five most important words on this entire cycle. God bless whoever in R&D came up with it. But if it's not your turn, you may exile a blue card from your hand rather than pay this spell's mana cost. Counter target non-creature spell. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. This fixes stuff like flashback spells as well. And again, the if it's not your turn is the brilliance. It was the, the thing that made Force of Will a little too good was that it both protected and stopped stupid things. Right. It could be proactive, yeah. This just stops stupid things. Yeah. And that's great. Yeah, one of the big complaints about Modern was that people felt like for a long time they didn't have any safety valves, where you didn't have Force of Will, so the turn three Karns could just sort of happen, or you know some other really stupid plays could take place. You didn't have Wasteland to really deal with the big mana decks. And so one of the things that people were really clamoring for was give us Counterspell, give us Force of Will, let us be, you know, let us be competitive, let us take care of some of these broken decks that we feel like we don't have any answers for. And Force of Negation was sort of the answer to that. Um, it's a lot more easier to cast than the five of Force of Will, so you can just pay three for it, which is fine. Um, the fact that it exiles a card is very, very relevant sometimes. Um, I use this in Vintage all the time. It's counter spells 5 and 6 for Dredge. Um, and it's just a beautiful card. It's a very simple design. And one of those cards where you're like, how did this not happen sooner? Uh-huh. You know, like, it, it's just so elegant and, and so easy. Super negate. Sometimes mm-hmm. it feels like 
development over develops cards. Yeah. This does not feel that way. This feels like development got a an already beautiful gem and honed it and cut it to a beautiful uh, uh, um, finish. And it just it it just works. It Force of Negation is just a really great final product. Mm-hmm. If it's not your turn, I just I can't. It's those perfect. Are, those are, it's such a, it's a an quality, amazing phrase. Yeah, I'm sh- the 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 meeting in which if it's not your turn was added to that card card must have been so gratifying. I can only imagine. All right, we want to hear to number five, Ruben. What's your number five? We're getting into some ridiculous stuff now. This uh, 2019 has been a heck of a year uh, for Magic the Gathering cards. Um, there was a tweet last year from Mark Rosewater where he said that 2019 is the year he's most excited for. Uh, and as we come to the end of 2019, it's kind of easy to see why. Because the power level of cards in 2019 has been so high that... Uh, there have been a number of cards banned, restricted, or otherwise removed from formats. And I'm not sure that Veil of Summer was one that people thought was going to be on the list. God. But it certainly was. Now banned in Standard, Pioneer, and Historic, Veil of Summer (laughs) is a one-mana green uncommon instant that was part of, like, a hate cycle. Mm -hmm. Draw a card if an opponent has cast a blue or black spell this turn. Spells you control can't be countered this turn. You and permanents you control gain hexproof from blue and from black until end of turn, which means that they can't be the target of spells or abilities your opponent's control. This card kept, uh, basically removed Thought Erasure from the format once it was printed. And Thought Seize from Pioneer. Yeah. And, uh, uh... And after it was banned, Casualties of War suddenly became the most played card (laughs) in Standard, which was an unthinkable thing with Veil of Summer in the format. Um, It got to the point where people were main decking Veil of Summer and Noxious Grasp and Aether Gust uh, because of how ubiquitous its abilities were uh, and how how, uh, uh, monochromatic decks were at the time. It's the best hate card ever printed. Yeah, this is my number eight, um, Color and eight we're cards. seeing impact in every single format right now. Uh, Modern wants it, Legacy wants it, Vintage wants it. Um, you know, the, the Storm decks are running green as a way to prevent, you know, whatever's going on. Um, you can also use it against Storm as a one-mana way of saying, you can't you can't Storm off, you can't target me with Tendrils of Agony, you can't target my permanence. Um, who would have thought that that one line of text in the order in which it was written would really be so massive? It's what, an 8 $9 uncommon from a core set like uh, I, think it's, I think it's just four at bucks peak, now at its peak it was but it's still a four dollar uncommon mm, right so it, it has it's fallen okay. a little bit from grace but okay. here's the thing in 2010 magic 2011 came out and it had the precursor to this card a card, a card called autumn's veil yeah now, autumn's veil Nobody also cared about oh absolutely they cost one green mana and was also an uncommon instant and went absolutely nowhere because all it said was spells you control can't be countered by blue or black spells this turn and creatures you control can't be the target of blue or black spells this turn not one mana cryptic command yeah. it didn't one mana cryptic <laughs> command you're like right. but then can I just, uh, just the game's over now can we done here because yeah. it just makes whoever you cast against look like completely foolish and you're like and i draw a card and we're done yeah. here we're done here because this card is stupidly powerful and crazily i mean just again this is one of those that first sentence didn't necessarily need to be there maybe it wasn't there maybe this used to cost two mana instead of just one mana but i mean the the balance and the power balance and the things that we're getting the on rate you know like Mm -hmm. wizards has to be more and more careful about like if you just if you err on the side of exciting you can't necessarily pull back. You can't give us another veil of summer that we can be necessarily happy and excited about when you've already given us a one man cryptic command. Fun fact, if you go back and read the M files on this card, sometimes Wizards releases these articles after a set comes out called the M files where they give you some insight as to the development and the design of a card. And it's usually set up in this round table format where they'll they'll post comments uh, in a discussion that people had. This card was originally pitched as graveyard hate. Mm. Um, I see you, Eli, I'm coming for you. Or was it Yanni? Yanni something. You're going down. But um, yeah, it was originally supposed to be Graveyard Hate, and then they shifted and made it this weird cryptic command amalgamation. So but, 10 yeah. years later, and it, and of course the card does friggin' everything. Even if they haven't cast a spell yet this turn, you can just cast it and then your spell, the next spell is, can be countered. So you're like, yeah. okay. Yeah, it prevents right. strip effects. It prevents thought seize effects. It prevents death, like bolts, wind yeah. conditions. Um, 
It's bananas how good a sideboard hate card turned out to be. Uh, yeah. And again, also, it just shows you what happens from Magic 2011 to Magic Course at 2020. Yeah. That's a stark difference in power level. All right, let's keep it rock and rolling here with number five. Aaron, what is your number five? My number five is the last hire on my list. Fair enough. All right. So for my number five, uh, it begins a uh, a trend of someone's name, comma, something, something, something. <laughs> because wizards lost their damn mind this year. <laughs> If you were a legendary creature or if you were a planeswalker, Wizards is like, here comes the gasoline. Yep, it was a good year for legendary permanents. Lord true. God, this card is bananas. It's come down to like reality. Like it, like when it first showed up, it was a million dollars. But it's kind of come back to reality. This card is its own archetype in and of itself. It was meant to be powerful. Lord God, it is. Um, Lord High, as it were. Um, because Urza, Lord High Artificer is the truth it is a stupidly crazy good magic card and wizards makes this food mechanic that just fuels a card like this which is insane urza lord high artificer is a mythic rare from modern horizons for two blue two generic mana it is a one four legendary human artificer and when urza lord high artificer enters the battlefield create a zero zero colorless construct artifact creature token with quote this creature gets plus one plus one for each artifact you control you may tap an untapped artifact you control to add one blue mana and five generic mana colon shuffle your library, then exile the top card until end of turn. You may play that card without paying its mana cost. And so those three abilities are about the Academy, about making a Karn and about the, um, what was the last one? The uh, uh, future site. No, the, the five generic mana colon was uh, Urza's something Temporal Aperture. Temporal Aperture. Thank you very much. So those are three things that are connected to Urza that happen on this one card. And that's cool and that's flavorful, but all these abilities together are stupid and like crazy powerful. It's one of Vintage Challenge mm -hmm. uh, in the hands of my friend I Am Level 1, Justin Gennari. Um, it's seen play in Legacy. It's currently dominating Modern right now. There's talk of it needing to be banned. I have to eat a little crow on this one because I remember when this card first came out. I didn't think anyone was going to play I know, it. Same. I looked at this and I was like, you want to pay four mana for a one four right. in modern? I'll just kill you before right. it matters. Exactly. Like, I did not care about this card at all. And I was over here um, just losing my mind. I and, like, now, it too. and now you have Gilded Goose, which is an artifact. You have Oko, which, you know, turns things into Elks, which, you know, is fine. Yep. Um, you know, you have uh, Emery, which also helps it out with being able to get artifacts back from the graveyard. You can form, I mean, you're playing a lot of zero. You're playing three engineered explosives in the main because you can. Mm -hmm. You're not even necessarily putting any counters on it. You right. just need to play a zero artifact. So you are playing almost like Vintage Light of Mishra's Bobble, Mox Opal, the Astrolabe, Explosives. I've even seen uh, Everflow chalice sure. you know artifacts that you wouldn't even care about but you just need to get them on the board so that when urza comes down you not only have these artifacts turning into mana rocks but it also makes that construct bigger and if you are playing outcome you can just have a really good time like i did not see this card coming yeah I, and i don't know I, I doubt we're going to talk about it so i'm just going to run out the cold shot but arkham's astrolabe was a friggin mistake what in the <laughs> heck were they thinking we're going to be talking about it later oh good because that card is buh rusted <laughs> It's broken. Rusted? It's broken and rusted. It's ba rusted. Ba rusted. Is this there like the, you the go. Like roof. Yeah. Ba rusted. Ba rusted. Wrestlered. <laughs> yeah. You know. Ba wrestlered. Ba wrestlered. Yeah. yeah. That was. That reminds me of when uh, when Crab Shack became a thing in vintage. I was like Crab Shack, <laughs> baby, baby Crab Shack. Crab Shack. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. Let's he move had on to number a storm four. count <laughs> as big as a whale. <laughs> yeah, he's about to cast Summer's Veil. He's All about right. To uh, cast <laughs> <laughs> Ruben, what's your number four? I thought we were just on Twitch things for the rest of the episode. My hey. number four uh, is I share it. I share the number four Ooh. slot with somebody. Look at you, both of you. Um, and uh, we I, agree on something. We agree on something. <laughs> and of all the cards that came out this year, um, I mean, it's it's a short list of things that can really be in a top ten, but uh, uh, in a top ten of the year. But if it's something that is banned in a format, it's gonna be in your top ten. If it's from a set, Modern Horizons, that literally broke multiple formats in half, um then it's going to be on the list. And this is currently the most expensive card from Modern Horizons. 
Yeah, so this card, uh, so for a while there, Legacy was dominated by these sort of check pile decks that uh, mana just was irrelevant. You could run Kolagon's Command and Wasteland and Leovold and True Name Nemesis yeah. because Deathrite Shaman, that's why. Um, and then Deathrite Shaman got banned, and the format started to kind of even itself out a little bit. Uh, we started seeing less of these three, four color decks, and people kind of went back to Blue Red Delver and just Blue White Miracles, and Storm was around, and Reanimator was around, and it was a thing. Um, and then this card came out and we found ourselves going back to that place where mana didn't matter anymore because legacy like a lot of formats relies on its fetch lands and if you can just keep looping fetch lands you're not even doing anything necessarily busted but you're just making sure that you never miss a land drop and so if you have perfect mana you know you can kind of do anything you want it also single-handedly kept death and taxes down death and taxes had been a pillar of legacy off and on for years and it was gone. No one was playing it because uh, Death and Taxes is nothing but one toughness creatures. And so Mother of Runes gone. Thalia gone. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, you can do the, the land thing. And so you're also playing Wasteland, which is a, another card that sees a lot of play in Legacy. So you're doing mana denial, mana fixing, keeping down an entire archetype. Um, and if the game happens to run long, you just get everything retraced. You ever see this when played guys, in Vintage, where you, you can just play Time Walks? You should probably say what the card is, because nobody knows. I mean, they probably know. It's called Ren and Six. <laughs> I thought we did. I'm sorry. No. He, did, he did not. He oh, kind of threw yeah. it to you to like, it's like say the card. To say what the sorry. Card. It's fine. It's fine. It's so cool. Ren and Six is a <laughs> mythic planeswalker from Modern Horizons. Legendary planeswalker Ren <clears throat> starts with loyalty three and has a plus one Jesus. for that two mana. God. Return up to one target land from your graveyard to your hand. Minus one. It deals one damage to any target, and minus seven, you get an emblem with instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard have retrace, which means it's. So, do you know how scary it is to see this in vintage and you get time walks with retrace? Ooh, you, that sounds. You, you, you will never. The game is over. Like, Sign I've me up for people, that. Rug Planeswalkers has been a thing off and on in Vintage since this card came out. Ancestral Recall? Sure! <laughs> like, re retrace, retrace says you may cast instant and sorcery cards from your graveyard by discarding a land card in Which addition to you're going to get back costs. by playing Red and Six. And so it's just, this card is dumb. Modern Jund even played it for like yeah. a week. Um, and I mean, just the impact on the formats it was legal and just cannot be disputed. And it was so good that it got banned in Legacy. And Legacy, they've been really... They tend to be slow banning things in Legacy. We had to wait years for Top to get banned. I mean, that was a thing. And this one was banned. It didn't even make it the year. Mm -hmm. I mean, in Legacy, that is, that's like light speed. Yeah, that's that's from zero to what? You were going how fast? Because Ren uh -huh. and Six, get the hell out of there. What is happening with this card, man? What yeah. is <laughs> what is our lives right now? Where well, Wizards... They tweaked like, the knob a little too hard away yeah. from Tybalt the Fiend blooded right. bad two mana planeswalker to Ren and Six good two mana planeswalker. I know. Way too good two mana right. planeswalker. You wanted to sell packs. I totally get it. But my <laughs> God, the plus one should have just been make, make a sandwich or something. You know, plus one should have been look at your neighbor and feel good. You know, like, no, no, no. Plus one is get your wasteland back. Say hello to the only card in the history of magic that is unrestricted in vintage, completely unrestricted in, and legal and modern, and banned in legacy. Where is that it has true? This, That's awesome. Yes, it's completely stupid. I can't understand what's happening. How crazy good this card is. They wanted to get it out of lightning bolt range, which I understand, but they somehow wanted to now hate out every X one in the format. Okay. Like I, I'm also I, just really fascinated by the characters. Like I want to know more about them. I hope we get to go to a place where we can. Well, they're broken. I mean, I'm not <laughs> sure. God. It's, well, I mean, it's still it's though, so you good. have like a being in a tree. Like, how right. did you get there? I want to know more about you. Right. Why is it Ren and not Six? Right? Am I right? I mean Right. right. Jesus. Who's who's cat who's pitching and all right. Which one of you is the red? Wow. Which one's the six? All right, I mean, I'm doing it. Here we go. <laughs> Nars all right, my my number four. Okay. My number four. First of all, uh I'm guessing it's Aaron's number five, because I know she would she'd like to list a card like this. Mm -hmm. This card, oh my god, man. This is like this is when you read about a card and they're, they're trying to tell you about it. And they're like, you know what? We were thinking about this card. We want to make this card. We really wanted to show, you know, older formats. Really, you know, we wanted to make an impact. We're not sure if it's going to make an impact. Maybe it'll make an impact. And oh my God, they've restricted the friggin' thing. Invantage already. <laughs> Speaking of zero to what? You restricted it already? Yeah. You can't get out of the conversation of 2019 and not talk about Narset Parter of Veils. This ridiculous. It was your number five? Uh-huh. Yeah, it was. This was my number six. Nice. 
<laughs> number six, number five, number four, Narset Parter Avails is a ridiculous magic card in almost any context. It is two blue and a generic mana for an uncommon legendary Planeswalker Narset. The foil, by the way, is about $14. Each opponent can't draw more than one card each turn. That's the static ability. That's it. That's that's the tweet. That's the one each opponent can't draw more than that's the tweet. <laughs> one card each turn. Uh, she starts with five loyalty. And for minus two, her only ability, you may look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal a non-creature, non-land card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So you get a dig through time's worth of dig through timing over two turns instead of just one for one extra mana. And you completely wreck older formats. Oh my God, what happened here? So this was a, this card was a judge's nightmare. Um, Between this one and Teferi and Karn, I saw judges on Twitter. They were like, I have given more warnings than I've ever given in my life because so much of we do is just so much of what we do is just sort of this extraneous drawing of cards that you don't even realize you're drawing more than one card per turn um what makes this particularly deadly is again the asymmetrical part of it the fact that you're uh, the irony is a lot of the decks that are playing this are blue decks so you're drawing as much as your heart's you're, you're drawing to your heart's desire and the other person cannot um when you're playing this in vintage a turn one narset is not unusual do you understand what a turn one narset is doing you are effectively not playing the game um, um, you pair this up with cards like Time Twister. Filthy. Do you know how bad it feels to be on the receiving end of an Echo of Eons when this card is out? Yeah, you don't get to draw seven cards. You are discarding your hand. You are watching your opponent draw seven, and you are at zero cards. You might as well just scoop at that point. Um, I have lost to that combo, or just this and any sort of wheel effect. It's freaking not fun. And so, um, you know, we talk a lot about, is a card fun? Um, you know, are you actually getting a chance to play Magic? And the reality is, you're not playing Magic if this card is out. Like, this card is ridiculous. And um, it's the one thing that, like, the dredge players and the blue players could agree on in Vintage was that we both hated this card. And um, at Eternal Weekend, there were over 400 copies at the event for 300 wow. players. I mean, um, the dominance of this card was just ridiculous. And, you know, let's staple on a dig through time while we're at it. Like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. They wanted to make sure it was going to be played in older formats. That was the thinking. When the Hero of Precinct 1 decks were popular, the Esper Hero decks were popular, they still played a bunch of narsets mm-hmm. even though it was a monocolored card it's an f- extremely powerful tool in the control decks um one might argue the most powerful tool in the mirror match mm-hmm. uh it is just a completely bananas card. and you just play paradox of the outcome and bounce it right. and refresh it and just like jesus christ or just play another one right uh-huh. and then the same thing applies it's just you get a all new dig through time <laughs> for you uh, good goodness gracious! Yeah, this is just one of those cards that it's it it's going to be one of those poster children of like what happened in 2019, and you're like, look at it, look at what they did, <laughs> look how you took our older formats and you put Narset in them. Oh my god! Look what you did to my boy. That's like right. it started off noble enough. Like I get what they were trying to do. I get that Leovold because I do think that effect is necessary and relevant to certain Powerful. formats. But um, you know, it has to have the right cost. I mean, you know, with Leovold, you got to look for three colors of mana, which is which is something. Um, you know, but the fact that it was all blue, you could cheat this out and at no downside to yourself, just none. Cards insane. Let's move on here to our number three. My one and only hire Ooh. is my number three. Wow. Ruben, what is your number three? Cañón de los Muertos is my number three, <laughs> uh, better known as Field of the Dead. <clears throat> so let's talk about Field of the Dead for a second. Um, not, what is just, just a second, though. Uh, it, kind, it, it did not immediately make an impact. No. It did not immediately set off alarm bells. It took until uh, Luis Scott Vargas was like, I kind of want to play this fun deck at this Grand Prix this weekend. And Scape Shift uh, was good with Field of the Dead. Like, we thought that was going to be a meme that with Scape Shift and Field of the Dead. Turns out it was the best thing that you could be doing in Standard by far. Uh-huh. And then it mm-hmm. completely took over. And then it took over to the point where you didn't even play Scape Shift. Like, you were just playing Magic with like Field Kodos. of the Dead. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so Field of the Dead is a land, just a regular, just a land. It enters the battlefield tapped. And when you tap it, you get a wing ding, you get a colorless, you get a generic. When Field of the Dead or another land enters the battlefield under your control, if you control seven or more lands with different names, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. This was, again, another lesson in you don't have to try. You just have to play magic. And so we got to a point where you were just putting this in your deck 
for the opportunity cost of having a weird mana base. Like, for the opportunity cost of having a Golgari Guildgate and a Blossoming Sands in your deck, like, you had a somewhat embarrassing mana base, but then you also just had the best possible late game that was very difficult to interact with. It also mm -hmm. took over partially because we lost a bunch of tools to fight against lands like Field of the Dead. We lost Blood Sun, we lost Alpine Moon. Um, there were there was one other tool that I'm forgetting the name of. But Field of Ruin? Field of Ruin, that's the one. And essentially, you lost <clears throat> everything except for like Assassin's Trophy and Casualties of War, which are both multicolored cards, and then this just took over. It just completely dominated uh, by itself for a little while and then shared the top spot for a little while. And it was very obvious that it had to go. Yeah, the timing on this was suspect. You know, Wizards has gotten a little bit better in terms of giving us answers to things, but there was just nothing. There was just nothing. And you had a card like Golos that would allow you to go looking for the lands that you needed. Um, you know, you could do Scape Shift if you wanted to, but um, it even saw play in older formats. Legacy Lands was playing this for a little while because, you know, why not? Um, you cannot interact with it. You know, it's just not anything that you have the tools to really deal with. Um, the games just looked miserable. I remember when the Kane Reinhard controversy mm -hmm happened a couple weeks ago and people were like you know aren't you mad that magic timed him out and i'm like no i'm mad watching this game like who would want to do this <laughs> like the games always just went to time they were just these long grindy slogs that no one really had the tools for i mean um, and just weren't fun and and normally i like zombies but i just couldn't get down with this i what 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 is the design of this magic card what what are you <laughs> trying to do what is happening in your life? You're trying to make Scapeshift a thing. Scapeshift, a card that is broken or terrible. There are no two ways about it. <laughs> so you want to make that card broken? Is that your idea? And then when somebody, like I read, I think today or yesterday, when I read that like Golos is basically Primeval Titan Jr., I was like, oh God, <laughs> oh God, it is. Oh, and like just going and getting a land, it's just one of the most insanely powerful things in Magic. And the land that makes threats for zero mana for right. the opportunity cost of played Magic like Tarmogoyf basically has. It's bananas yeah, how I good I, this card is. I don't know if I'm going to ruin Brawl for you all, but like the most popular Brawl deck by far is Golos that just goes and gets a field of the Absolutely dead. not. <sighs> all right. Uh, so let's move on here to number three for Aaron. What you got? My number three is a card that you touched on a little bit ago um, that just multi-format dominance. Um, obviously, it was a Titan in Popper, but they're running it in Modern in the Urza deck now. Uh, Legacy is using it. This is the card that people were using along with Renin 6 to go back to sort of those check pile days where mana was irrelevant. And it is even seen play in Vintage because um, you know Vintage lives and dies by its artifacts. This is an artifact that you are more than happy to have, especially if you can bounce it. My number three is Arkham's Astrolabe. Um, so Arkham's Astrolabe is one snow no mana. It could be paid with one mana from a snow permanent. It's a snow artifact as well. Um, when Arkham's Astrolabe enters the battlefield, draw a card. Um, you can pay one colorless and tap it to add one mana of any color. Um, this wreaked havoc on Pauper. Um, you saw color combinations that you never thought you'd see. Black, white, pestilence was now running a third color because why not? Uh, mana became irrelevant. What was supposed to be a downside had the opposite effect in that nobody runs non-snow basics anymore. Yeah. Like, this card changed the way that we build our mana bases now, um, which I don't think people ever expected. This was meant to be a drawback of, oh, man, you guys are going to need to run Snow Basics now. And we're like, okay, <laughs> where's the downside here? Um, you know, the fact that it fixes your mana, the fact that it's an artifact, again, for those Urza-style decks, for the Paradoxical Outcome decks, um, getting that value of drawing a card and then your mana doesn't matter anymore. Um, it, it looks harmless enough, but, man, just to see the impact of this card... In every single format it could touch, it did, and just they finally banned it in Popper. Like, yeah, thank thank God. Like this card is on rate unbelievable. Not only is it on rate unbelievable in terms of like one mana to draw a card and on a thing that is an artifact that is now a permanent that can trigger other things that can tap for Urza or whatever, but you just completely invalidate the color pie at that point because you're like cast it with any color you want as long as it's a Snowland, and then get any color you want no matter what Snowland you used. <laughs> like, what's a mana cost anymore if that's what you're right. doing? And f future astrolabes cast more astrolabes, um, oh, which God. is even worse. Yeah, one mana artifact that replaces itself uh, obviously took over Pauper. 
Um, nothing could be played without Arkham's Astrolabe and Popper. It's tough to play, like, anything without Arkham's Astrolabe, period, in a lot mm-hmm. of these formats, because it's it just, it, it replaces itself, it's able, you know, it's a permanent that has value that you're able to target it with other stuff later. It's it's pretty absurd. Yeah, it is It is a powerhouse of a, of just a, a small, innocuous almost. Yeah, You're very. like, this is going to be the best thing to do in multiple formats? You're going to start playing this thing in what format? Yeah. Legacy's playing this? <laughs> like, what? Yeah. And because the rate Didn't is you? so strong, the uh, ease, the and the, the who cares about a color pie? Like every every time they do that, it bites them. Every time. Yeah. And yet they keep doing it. All right, let's move on here to number two. Ruben, what you got? I really wanted to put this card at my number one, but I couldn't quite do it. Um, this is the one card on my in my top, I think seven, maybe top six. Yeah, top six that didn't that avoided the ban list. <clears throat> it's still legal. Still legal in standard, still legal in all the formats, but it's like right there and it's dominated multiple times and it's been the topic of conversation every other week since it was printed. It was commonly and still to this day is like commonly referred to as the best thing you can be doing in a couple of formats, Um, but it's just right there. It's not quite the best. And so therefore has stayed in standard. It has stayed in pioneer. It has stayed in modern. It has even seen a little bit of play in legacy. Um, My number two is Teferi, Time Raveler. Mm -hmm. Teferi is a colorless, a white, and a blue for a four loyalty legendary planeswalker Teferi with the static ability. Each opponent can cast spells only at a time they could cast a sorcery. Vomit. Plus one. Until your next turn, you may cast sorcery spells as though they had flash. Minus three, return up to one target artifact creature or enchantment to its owner's hand. Draw a card. Um, there's a lot of games that are just over if a Teferi resolves on turn three. <laughs> it's so dumb. It's so stupid. Um, you know, Flash style strategies have been making a comeback recently. Either Is It or Simic. Uh, and, and Teferi is the bane of those decks' existences. It's tough to just play Magic if your opponent just has Teferi on the board. Uh, it swings... Uh, tempo in an extremely ridiculous direction. It's part of the Just Guy Fires decks right now. Um, yeah, it's it's absurd. Cards like this really kind of like Narset, they really make you reconsider how you play the game because Magic has so many phases of a turn and, and you do so many things in response to other things. And when you really think about that of sorcery speed and then you try and just do things and you're like, nope, can't do it, can't do it, can't do it. It turns off a lot of play patterns at three mana. Like what? what? <laughs> Again, a static ability or even just other abilities that don't affect you uh, are just ridiculous. The ability to deal with any permanent with, with the blink of an eye. I mean, come on. <laughs> this was my number three, my only hire. And because there's what what is happening and, and remember, Corset 2021 is all about Teferi because we certainly have not gotten enough Teferi out of the Hero Dominaria and the Time Raveler being two of the How, best Planeswalkers yeah. ever. I was going to say, is, last year's card of the year for our show, the Mikesies, was Hero of Dominaria. Time mm-hmm. Raveler is going to be up there. It's going to be a nominee for card of the year. How could you? And then, then next year is going to be the Teferi year? Like, come on. I don't I don't know. All I'm saying is that one line of text, each opponent can cast spells only any time they can cast a sorcery. Not they can only cast during their turn. Right. Not they can only cast instants or sorceries at whatever speed or whatever. Like there's no there was no sort of way to let your opponent get some. Like this is just like one hundred percent locked off from anything beyond your two main phases. I hope you enjoy them. And have fun with them because that's pretty much all you're doing. And not only that, you can't respond to anything during those main phases. You're just playing stuff and hope it happens. Yeah. So between being the ultimate way to protect yourself from counter spells and an incredible tempo play because you're drawing a card and you're bouncing a thing, like it doesn't look like it would be the best thing happening in many formats. But man, it's it's got all the right numbers, all the right tweaks, and this is one that, for what it's worth. It's very, very powerful, powerful, but I don't think it's too powerful. I think I think they actually got this one right, that it's super good, and it's right at the cusp. But yep. you know it's not really bannable. It's right. good. It's super good. It's annoying, but it's not, I feel, a bannable card in terms of what it does. Anyway, Aaron, what's your number two? My worst nightmares were realized when I woke up on a Saturday morning, the morning of a pro tour, 
And I rolled over and I looked at my phone and I saw what was going on. I think it might have even been a Friday. It was it was it was the morning of a pro tour. And I woke up, I looked at my phone, and I scrolled Twitter like I won't to do. And somebody had posted an analysis of what the top cards were of the weekend, which is not unusual. Uh, and I'm I'm starting at the bottom. <laughs> And I'm working my way up and I'm still not seeing anything unusual. And then it starts to get really grim. And to my horror, I, I think I'm dreaming because this can't possibly be happening. My worst nightmare has come true. Leyline of the Void is the top car. A thousand copies were being played at this pro tour. Can you imagine my horror and my shock that we had gotten to this point? And we got to this point because of my number two, which is Hogak Arisen Necropolis. Um, so Hogak Arisen Necropolis is five colorless and two hybrid mana, black and green, legendary creature avatar, eight, eight. You cannot spend mana to cast this spell. Again, supposed to be a drawback with Convoke and Dome. <laughs> So each creature you tap while casting the spell pays for one colorless or one mana of that creature's color. Each card you exile from your graveyard pays for one. So you need at least two creatures to do this. You, you need something. Um, you may cast it from your graveyard. Oh, and it has trample. <laughs> So I remember when this card first came out, this was another card I need to eat some crow over because um, people were playing this um, in these sort of Altar of Dementia decks. So that was how the deck first started. You were running this with Altar of Dementia. You were playing uh, the Carrion Feeder, the Blood Gas, and you were either getting them with sheer force. You would sacrifice things to the altar and then Bridge from Below triggers would happen and you would beat them down with zombies. You would do a Field of the Dead impression. And if that didn't work, you would just mill them to death. Um, or you would play this card and do really stupid things. They banned Bridge from Below, and it almost made the deck better because you didn't even need that. And so you played your Seder Wayfinders, you played your Stitcher Suppliers, and you played this sort of fair game, um, and people tried to beat it. I was convinced that if we gave people enough time, maybe something would happen, but rest in pieces didn't work. Cages didn't work. Um, surgical extractions didn't work. People tried. People in Modern gave it their best shot to the point where you were main decking Leyline of the Voids at the Pro Tour because that's what it took. Um, and even then, the deck still put up a, a, a respectable performance despite all of that and then the card got banned in modern um it has some neat plays around containment priest because you're casting it from the stack hmm. not necessarily your graveyard hmm. so you can get around containment priest that wow. way which is hilarious yes you can um you know it's just a dumb card you can loop them so like if you have you know two out and you get more bridge triggers that way you can pitch it to force of vigor i mean the card is just dumb and i'm so grateful that it's here and it has trample <laughs> like what in the world what the hell it's so stupid uh, this was yeah. my number eight by the they're way they're running nice. into the dark depths decks and legacy so you, sure. you can play you know you play your your hex mages your stitcher suppliers the elvish reclaimers and yeah you'd like to get a dark depths out but you're also just fine with this too <laughs> i can't i can't it's absurd first of all <laughs> quote of 2019 said on this very podcast I can't get it up for Modern Horizons. I just want y'all to know those were words that left the mouth of one of these co-hosts said that. And I'm over here just like losing my mind, the flipping out. Can get it up for Modern Horizons. Good God. Nothing about Modern Horizons in terms of where they pushed was remotely fair. The thing, the fact that this had trample was just so egregious. Yeah. Turn well, two, turn three. <laughs> yeah. The thing is absurd. Um, couldn't the chump block it. We couldn't make like a bitter blossom to make blockers <laughs> for it. No, no, no. We can't have that. The altar of dementia combo was particularly egregious that they God. put both of those cards in, into Modern Horizons for the first time into the modern format. Mm -hmm. And yeah, Hogak still sees play in Legacy. As it should, because it's a busted card for yeah. what should have been a yesteryear of broken things. And this came out this year. Yeah. Uh, now proudly a 76 cent card. Back, back to where it belongs. Uh, oh my god. My number two is, again, I have, my number five through my number two are blank, comma, something about them. Okay? Because number two is no different. Whether it's a legendary creature or whether it is a planeswalker, Wizards has just decided that the, there's no holds barred anymore. We're doing everything on everything. And let me tell you, there was certainly a time when wizards got scared of mana flares 
Now, Mana Flares, the original Mana Flares, when you tap a land for mana, you get two mana out of it. Okay, cool. And then there was Heartbeat of Spring, which to put that thing into green. It turned out to make its own kind of crazy, wacky deck at the time. And that was kind of where we left Mana Flares, what, 12 years ago now, 13 years ago, <laughs> something crazy, when the rocks were soft. And when it came back in the form of Nyssa, who shakes the world... This card is ridiculous. Yeah. Now, I'm just talking about this. This one doesn't necessarily get, make it to Pioneer. I actually don't know. But I, I know it's not going to see much play in Modern, as I understand it. Oh, it made it to Pioneer. That's why they banned a bunch of the stuff the oh. first week. Oh, they good. Well, there Oath, you go. They banned Oath of Nyssa and uh, something else the first week. Uh, absolutely. And <laughs> so Nyssa, who shakes the world, is... Such a bananas card. It is so crazy good for five mana. This who shakes the world is a rare from War of the Spark. It is two green, three generic mana for a five loyalty legendary planeswalker Nissa. Has its magical static ability of whenever you tap a forest for mana, add an additional green. Plus one, put three plus one plus one counters on up to one target non-creature land you control. Untap it. It becomes a zero zero elemental creature with vigilance and haste. That's still a land. Minus eight colon, you get an emblem with, quote, lands you control have indestructible. Search your library for any number of forest cards, put them onto the battlefield tap, then shuffle your library. They say shake it, don't break it. She shook it and she broke it. Um, this is another card that people love to say should be banned and standard. Um, it's just a powerful card. I got so to experience good. this in the Flood My Basement deck where you would play this with Flood of Tears. Um, and if you couldn't do the Omniscience thing, you would just like loop this with Tamios and do like really stupid things and just make a bunch of lands and destroy somebody. Um, this card is ridiculously powerful. Again, with this sort of asymmetrical, you know, kind of effects. This one being one that benefits you. Um, and if you're playing the right deck, if your deck is built to do this, it does it very, very well. And whoo, the power level of this thing is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Because Breeding Pool is a forest mm -hmm. so when you tap it for blue mana it's mm -hmm. technically tapping a forest so you also get the green on top yep. of it you get the you get the peanut butter and the chocolate mm -hmm. you get the benefit just for yourself so you don't have to share it yep. it's only five mana in a format full of mana producing dorks and cards that can accelerate you into this thing yep. itself this was the one of the cards where i was hearing the pros were just like i'm, I'm just jamming for nissa i'm yeah. just going for nissa as soon as i get nissa you just plus one all day long yeah. and that's how you win the game whoever gets nissa first is going to have the nissa advantage yep. and it's often just too much and that's why uh noxious grasp and aether gust became so popular as main deck cards for a little while mm -hmm. there as well uh, Cards Absurd, it won um, Mythic Championships twice, uh, once at Mythic Championship 3, and then the next one at 6 or 7 uh, mm -hmm. in the Simic Ramp deck, too. Yeah, this card is just crazy good on raid, crazy powerful. Whew, yeah, we've entered a new world, and uh, and part of it belongs to Nyssa, who shakes it, as it were. Shake it. Nice. Shake it. Oh, don't stir it. That's right. All right, we turn the corner here to our number one. Ruben, what is your number one card? I share my number one. Oh, my God. We've had two shares tonight, That's Ruben. Right. Um, our number one is, I mean, it's tough to argue against this card. How could it not be your number one, I Evan? didn't. I didn't because I knew it was going to be yours. it was going to be ours. Yeah. And I'll, I'll tell you what, mine's, actually, mine's going to corner in there really nicely. Go ahead. Actually, yours is a legendary uh, something also, right, Evan? Nope. No? Okay, I thought nope. you said your top five were all something, comma, something, something. I said my number five, my number okay. two to number five. I was afraid we were going to miss a card, so I'm glad you have it at number one. <laughs> um, but yeah, our number one is Oko, Thief of Crowns. I mean, how could it not so, be? It's, it's Oko, banned Thief in, of... Sorry. Oh, sorry. It's banned sorry. in four formats. I'm going to remember Jesus. this time. Uh, so Oko is through from Throne of Eldraine. It's one colorless, a green and a blue, legendary planeswalker Oko, starting with four loyalty. You can plus two and create a food token. You can plus one, plus one, target artifact or creature loses all abilities and becomes a green elk creature with base power and toughness 3-3. Three, three. You can minus five it to exchange control of target artifact or creature you control and target creature and opponent controls a power three or less. There is no format that has not been touched by this card. Modern, legacy, vintage. There have been screenshots of all of the things that Oko has done. You want to beat somebody to death with a black lotus? You can do that. You want to take a Merit Lage, one of the baddest bitches in the multiverse, and reduce her to a 3-3 elk? You can do that too. Um, it's banned in what, two formats now? Four. One format? Four. Four. Historic, Brawl, Standard, Pioneer. It is a stupidly, crazily <laughs> power. They put Beast Within on a plus one. Like, oh. that... 
Last ability, I, who cares? What is happening in that last ability? No one cares. The card's and that's, stupid. If that's not enough for you, if you're playing an Oath of Druids deck and you're having a really hard time finding your Forbidden Orchard and you want to make sure you get your Oath of Druids, turn anything they have into a creature and you'll get your Oath trigger. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. It immediately ticks up to six. So mm -hmm. Fry doesn't take care of it. Uh, Kaya's Retribution, the black common that should be able to take care of any Planeswalker, uh, doesn't take care of it. It's It's absurd. Yeah, it is. I mean, I didn't put it on my number one. I think I appreciate it. First of all, I really appreciate you guys putting it on there because I was like, oh, my God, please make yeah, sure you put it on there. We got it. Because I, I just like yeah, this is one of those like it's the clear. It's a it's a mistake. This is yeah. card like literally is a mistake. I don't know exactly how the numbers exactly when. are just wrong. Like there's nothing inherently wrong with what's going on on Oko. Right. If, I, I'm not of the opinion that food as a mechanic is broken. I'm not of the opinion that this card, because of what it does, is broken, but the right. numbers are so wrong. The numbers, in my opinion, should have been plus one, minus one, and you can keep the minus five or whatever. Or it should um, cost four mana. Or it should have cost four mana, or maybe even five. Maybe. Like, this card just does so much. When it nullifies literally anything your opponent plays, there was this crazy moment during a legacy match where the reanimator player, it, it didn't matter what you're going to reanimate. Right. It's just going to turn into an elk next turn. And so, like, sure, play your Gristlebrand, draw all your cards. It's just going to be an elk next turn. You're never going to get all that life back. You can only hope to, like, through the breach or whatever and try to give it haste. Otherwise, nothing you did mattered. Oko is just nuts. There was a weekend, like, this was, like, one of the first weekends it was ever printed after it was printed was it won the vintage the legacy yeah. and the modern challenge yeah. all that's okay was it nuts this card does freaking everything and wizards like you know they're doing this like weird um well you know we didn't really um something something oko something something last minute changes how many times have we been here how yeah. many times yeah. and now clearly the question is okay. All right, so so let's let's go back just to just a second because I I got to show you to get this for uh, for comparison. I want you to take a look at the card called Kiora, Master of Depths. Oh sure. <laughs> okay, and actually, oh, Kiki. I want to give you a better one. I want you to go look at Kiora, the Crashing Wave oh, from boy. Born of the Gods. I this, don't know her. This card is trash, like <laughs> tragedy trash. Kiora, more like Basura. Oh my God, it's. <laughs> Kiora the Crash Wave costs that four mana, only starts at two loyalty, has a plus one, minus one, and minus five. Oh, weird. It's almost like we just said those exact numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and or a higher converted mana cost. So if you look at how that card did absolutely nothing, including trying to prevent damage from stuff and trying to draw cards and play extra lands, which it went absolutely nowhere, you have a plus one beast within. You have a plus two, make an artifact. Plus two, it's going to make you gain life. Plus two, that's going to feed a bunch of abilities. And not saying that food is broken, just that it's a mistake, just to be clear. Yeah. Um, but nothing about this card is fair. Nothing. And we've got like, this is the best Planeswalker ever printed. I don't, I don't know a better one. I don't know a Planeswalker that nullifies literally Imrakul. You yeah. can play Imrakul. Oko don't care. Yep. That's nuts. That's stupid. That's 29. This is 2019 right here. You guys did a great job. Thanks for doing that number one. Cause it's Oko. Yeah. It's Oko. Oko Broko. But I did make room in my number one. For yeah, I gotta other, see what beat Oko. Yeah. For the other blue green creature that happens to somehow dominate standard from the very minute it was printed. What? This is and here's why. From the moment it was released in January of this year, Hydroid Crisis has been in top tier decks from the second it saw print. So yes, Oko is Broko. Oko's only been around what, three months now, yeah. two months now? No, no. Hydro Crisis all year long has done nothing but dominate the standard format from beginning to end. It's true. Hydro it's, Crisis. It's doing what what Teferi Time Raveler did and mm -hmm. uh, staying staying right at the top without getting banned. Hydro Crisis is blue, green, and an X for a jellyfish Hydra Beast. It is a mythic from Ravnica Allegiance, and it has a 0-0 zero, zero with when you cast this spell, you gain half X life and draw half X cards, round down each time. has flying and trample, so flample, and it enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it. So when you combine the number two I had of Nyssa with this number one of Hydro Crisis, you have a giant monster that's gaining you life, bringing you back into the tempo race, drawing you a bunch of cards, which you're fueled up by your crazy mana flare, and Crisis has just not stopped. Even when they print claim the Firstborn, which should have been like the ultimate Hydroid Crisis hosers, you get to get uh -huh. it for one mana. And it Legion's don't matter. End. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's not good enough because all the other cards around it don't get hit by that or don't get affected enough by that. And so crazies can still be there being your draw engine and your giant monster. And I was like, 2019, yes, we're in the Oko world right now. And we're all about Oko. And I'm like, but all year long, we have seen, looked at, saw this thing being played and slammed onto tables, digital or otherwise, the whole time. Yeah. This, I I wonder what, when I look at the Simic cards from War of the right? Spark or, or Ravnica Allegiance, they're just so random where it's like, why does this thing have flying and trample? Why? Like you see some, yeah. Roalesque was another one where it's like, here's just some word soup that we stapled yeah. onto it. Like they lost their minds with Simic um, and, yeah. and no card exemplifies that more than this one where it's just so random. Why does it give you cards and life? Why? <laughs> it's Sphinx's revelation, but it's the Simic version of it. Uh, and it's a finisher. Like it's 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 wild. Yeah, you know, it turns out just drawing half of the X and right. gaining half of the X. Still good enough. Still good enough to absolutely dominate formats. Uh and here we are with our top ten list. You will I'm see going them. to I'm gonna do something uh a little bit weird here because I feel very strongly that a card was supposed to be on our lists and okay. wasn't. So I'm going to Leviathan. Re- no, this is not a Leviathan moment. This is a once upon a time moment, mm. um, which we didn't reference in any of our top 10. So I'm going to put it at my number one over Oko um, because I feel like it deserves mention as the number one card for once upon a time. Um, and, and so I've decided, I apologize for, for, for having a, a Kanye moment here, but once upon a time is the greatest of all time. Colorless in a green instant. If this spell is the first spell you've cast this game, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. Look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal a creature or land card from among them and put it in your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Banned in Standard. Banned in Pioneer. Banned in Historic. Free card. Free instant that replaces itself. It's card selection. It's a huge piece of why those blue-green decks have been so popular. It's able to dig for your Gilded Goose or for your Breeding Pool to be able to get your turn one combo. It is absurd and well-deserving of a number one spot, I think. I think that once upon a time is like it's free and free is busted like every time from burning tree emissary onto anything you can delve down to like nothing one man or so. Uh If you make it free or cost less and particularly the free part, it's almost always busted. Once upon a time is a great idea Mm -hmm. that just goes too far. If it had adventurous, I think it's adventurous impulse where you look at the top three and you do this essentially. If you look at the top three when you play it for free, for example, I think it would have been fine. But when you look at five both times, when you're able to, I think uh, Frank Karsten said you could essentially shave two lands out of your deck if you play a play set of once upon a time. Right. And it's just, you're finding your best start and it created these these similar game states and these similar gameplay sort of you know patterns that would happen and like you know part of the goal and i can imagine in magic game design is you want it to be unique and to have different experiences and interactions and understand that some of them are going to be kind of weird and annoying like the cat oven thing but you have to be okay with the cat oven thing and have people can do things about it to stop it whereas once upon a time it's like at the beginning of every game you want this to fire off that's that's your positive game design moment. I particularly enjoyed the memes that came out of this card in terms of so many people were using it like at the wrong time. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I enjoyed seeing all the tweets of like, for the love of God, would you stop doing this on like my end step? Like, wait till you draw a card. <laughs> and just seeing all the baddies figure out how to use it because they're so programmed to treat it like a fetch land. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, there you go. So those are our new updated Top 10 cards from 2019. You'll see them on screen right now for your review. Take a look at my list, Aaron's list, Ruben's top 10, and we want to hear from you about what card we did not talk about. And we'll select our favorite to win a $50 gift certificate to CoolStuffInc.com. But before we go, I want to thank my co-host. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ruben. Honk. Uh, I am for, not Probably for the last time this year. Thank God. Moving on to our final slide. I want to thank our sponsor, CoolStuffInc.com, our co-sponsor, CardHoarder.com, my co-host, Aaron Campbell and Ruben Bressler. You guys for watching or listening, and I hope you support us at Patreon.com slash Magic Mics. Follow, like, tweet, favorite, share, subscribe to everything social that tells people we exist. Catch us online at Twitch.tv at Magic Mics, on Twitter at Magic Mics Cast, our Magic Mics subreddit, and like the Magic Mics page on Facebook. Talk to us privately at Magic Mics Podcast at gmail.com. Follow the audio-only podcast at Magic Mics Podcast at Libsyn.com, or find us on iTunes and Spotify. Join us here next week, same time, same place, for another episode of Magic Mics. Good night, everybody.